you dedicate, let's start at the end, you dedicate to, to two people, um, uh, Tom Luddy, who's yeah. a great film person of cinema and uh, organizer of festivals and historian, uh, who we know very well in uh, Vienna, and Fardin, who we don't know so well. He's Muhammad Ali Fardin, uh, yes. who's in yeah. your film. Yeah. Um, and you include extracts from four of his films as yeah. a director. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit about Fardin, what he means to you, what he means to Iranian cinema, and why you chose him as one of the dedicatees. Fine. Actually, I, I would also like to talk about Tom, Tom Luddy, who passed away earlier this year, because we were discussing the idea of Passeur yesterday, or, or you know, the term I prefer is Saints of Cinema. And he was also one of them, not because he was the director of Telluride Film Festival, but when it was almost impossible to travel to um, Cuba or Soviet Union in the 70s, early 70s, he was the one who was going there and bringing out all these masterpieces like Soy Cuba. So the first version of Soy Cuba, what ever seen in the West was the one that he actually discovered and brought back. So he was one of the saints. And Ahmad is another type of saint because he was a movie star. He was a, a, a dashing uh, Fadin. A Muhammad Ali Fadin, Fadin figure. Yeah. And he was in a great number of films, maybe you know, close to 60, 70 films. But then he was one of those people whose career was interrupted by the revolution and he was banned overnight. And uh, then when you look at the films, and the films are about different things. They're musicals, gangster films, melodramas, whatever. But the films have the capacity to convey, relay, and tell any other story as they come here in the service of telling Amaz's story. And then he died because he was also a wrestling champion. He was a world champion. Uh, the television announced that Mama Ali Fadin dead today. He was a wrestling champion no mention of his film career. He was perhaps the most popular Iranian actor ever. You could compare him to Sean Connery or to Shiri Mifune, that kind of a, a John Wayne, like a sort of tough guy? It's very, no, no, because he could sing and dance. He could be the tough guy. He was the good-hearted fellow. More, I would say, like, more of a Vittoria Gossman, if you could you know, think of an Italian example, capable of acting in both dramas and, and, and lighter films. And also good-looking, popular, not only in Iran, in, in the region, India, Lebanon, uh, Turkey. So uh, that's why I decided, and I have used his films, of course, here. It was one way of paying tribute to him, because this is a film of many parallel stories. The entire range between relatively objective history to autobiography, and I needed to fill the gaps with different threads. And this was one of the threads. Of course, Hitchcock is another thread. The history of the physicality of film is another thread. It's, and for me, Fardin was like, the story of the Fardin is also there. The tragedy of the Fardin, the rise and fall of it, is in a way in, 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 in what you see uh, in the clips in the film and what, happened, what happens to these uh, uh, 35 mil prints. And I believe Fadin ended up uh, running a pastry shop in Tehran. He had a carpet. He was selling rugs. Yeah, yeah. And did you choose Leighton Stone because of the Hitchcock connection? Was I it, live there. Was it just Every happy... morning when I open the window, I see Hitchcock. Not because there's any sign of him there, because there's absolutely no sign. The thing is, when you live in Leighton Stone, you realize that Hitchcock became Hitchcock because nothing happens here. You really need imagination to get by. You, so quiet, suburban looking, Essex-ish sort of place, and beautiful, green. But then, you know, my study, there's a scene there, and you have all those rear windows. And I've been sitting there for years and looking to see people having sex or killing each other, but absolutely not. So, you know, a bit of drama was necessary to make life bearable in late in the sun. And it's a wonderful place. So he was, again, it was pure coincidence, I ended up in Leighton Stone. And then I, you know, I lived behind Hitchcock Hotel. So it's, I call, you know, you might call it fate, whatever, it's, it's there. So it's like the, the ongoing source of inspiration there. Does it, maybe you sometimes you peer in the windows and people are watching Hitchcock films in the Hitchcock Hotel. Could, oh, happen? no, it doesn't happen. But Hitchcock Hotel, actually, they show films by Hitchcock, which is very lovely to, to go there and they have all the posters. It's, it's one of those secret... Uh, beauties of London, like one of the places that, you know, if you don't want to go to Trafalgar Square, go to East London, and there are different monuments there in, in his memory. And ironically, or, well, coincidentally or fatefully, David Beckham is also from that part of London. <laughs> yeah, but the most, uh, the, another 
uh, latent stone source of inspiration for my film. A director that, because of his name, is not very well known because it could be the name of anyone. John Smith is his name, actually. He's one of the greatest filmmakers from Britain, experimental uh, director, and he has made some really amazing films in the 70s in latent stone. Tribute to Hitchcock again hypnotizing, very mysterious Hitchcockian films without actors, just with the neighborhood buildings. And he was a source of inspiration because, I, and I told John that, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing an imitation of you in Leighton, and I'm going around and looking at buildings, looking for signs of Hitchcock. Uh, and his most famous film is uh, The Girl Chewing Gum, which is maybe the most famous British experimental film. That's Leightonstone? That's not Leightonstone, no. The, the, the black uh, box or something, that is definitely late and it's not shot not too far from where I shot this film. And you mentioned uh, John Smith, Britain. It is a British film. As a British person, it's nice to see British films in the Viennale. We think of Terence Davies, who was here two years ago. And Another inspiration. That was one of the first things I wrote. The last line of, of Time in the City. Farewell, uh, fair ladies, farewell, fair ladies, repeats it twice and says, I know how to end the film. Farewell, Ahmad. It was right out of Terence Davies. <laughs> If you're going to steal, steal from the best, as, the, as they say. Um, and in, it's also made in collaboration with the Cinema Museum of London. Now, being I don't live in Britain anymore, but we hear terrible things about film culture, support for film, um, uh, crisis in, in British cinema, crisis in, in, in many, many areas. Do you feel that living in London? And was it a, a struggle to get a film like this Visibly. off the Visibly. Everywhere, but also in London. I can see how film culture is going down everywhere. And it's very, very sad, especially in Western Europe, when there is the tradition of showing great cinema and making no compromises. But I see people making compromises, looking at film culture as a luxury. Uh, and uh, at best, when there is money at some, you know, uh, a kind of uh, state-run or semi-state-run institutions have, it's, they've been managed, being managed like corporates. Uh, I have seen this change, and uh, to me, it's also one of the reasons I've shot the film in, f f partly in uh, Cinema Museum, because it's a volunteer-run project, and it's a place in which Chaplin, as a, as a, as a child, who's working in, in this shoe factory, which has become this volunteer-run museum, and it's full of life there, the kind of cinema that we want to see and the mood we want. It's not something chic for, you know, sh showing off prestige, cultural prestige of the country. It's real cinema, the way it should be in the films you want to see. But, yeah, I still believe that in the film club back in Mashhad, we were showing more adventurous films. If you, I don't want to name names, but if you go and, go and look at the program of any major Western European cinema tech, it's uh, predictable, to say the least. But you, I didn't mention this in the introduction, but as well as a filmmaker, you're also, what's the actual job title? Artistic director? I am the co-director of... The co-director of Cinema Ritrovato in Bologna. Uh, for people who don't know what that is, in a, in a nutshell, what is Cinema Ritrovato? Well, it's, it's a festival in Bologna happening the last month of June. It's dedicated to uh, film history, film preservation, film restoration, retrospectives. And, uh, you know, I've been involved with them relatively recently, so I cannot take credit for anything. But this is one of the last strongholds of pure cinema in the world, meaning that, you know, just cinema, no waste of time, great films, essential films, or important films, shown back to back. And uh, there were some scenes also, you could see the people, uh, outdoor screenings in the main piazza of the city that was shot in Bologna. So that's actually the continuation uh, what uh, I was doing back there, back in Iran, in, in Bojnord or Mashhad or, or, or Tehran. I was joking with a friend that when I look at the film, I realize I've been doing the same thing since the age of five, which is, you know, not very exciting, but, you know, I have nothing to complain. And you, you mentioned in the film, obviously, Ahmad says he would like to have a family, and, you know, you filled a, maybe a role for him there, but were your uh, kind of actual parents or family, were they the ones that, at the very beginning, got you into the cinema world? How, what was the actual starting point for you? With, like, the contribution of my, the role that my parents had in this? Yeah, or, or friends, or how, how did it begin? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's what I needed. Um, well, freedom. Do whatever you like. That's, oh, thank you. It's really appreciated. Freedom. Uh, 
because we were having this discussion yesterday, it was a different question, but a similar answer, that the freedom that they, you know, you can do whatever you like, but they were also extremely worried, and they voiced that many, many times, especially my mother, that, you know, because it was, you know, it was, risks were taken, and she was unhappy about it at the same time, too. But this is, if my parents watched the film, this is the first time they are going to actually learn who I am and what I do, because we never discuss these things. And this was a, <laughs> when cutting the film, some, it's totally silly, I know, but a very simple moment in the film. I'm in my early 20s, maybe I'm 20, 21. And we're in my clubhouse thing out, out of the city, and I'm smoking a cigarette there. And with my editor, we were just, can I, my, because my mother doesn't know I smoke. I've been a smoker for 20 years. And I thought, if my mother sees this, she's going to kick my ass. Uh, but we, okay, let's keep it, because this is the only way I can tell her, sorry, mom, I've been a smoker for the past two decades. Or you could do a jump cut, or your hand could appear and, and obscure no, the cigarette. No, you know, the ab absolute truth, you know, just we, we, can, we can keep it in the film. And, they, and presumably they say it's good that you have your architecture studies because you've got something to fall back on if the film stuff doesn't work out. It's you know, like a real job. Um, it's, my grandmother was the only one who was, you know, very... Uh, uh, it was, she was insisting on this. Like I, all the, she passed away and uh, until the very end. I said, don't you want to go back to architecture? It's much nicer, isn't it? It's definitely nicer. I'm going to make more money. But too late now. It's too late to stop now. Sure, I'm sure she was very proud, oh. quietly. Uh, we do have time for questions. I've got one last one. Eckhard Fulk, uh, who did the music for the film, which is a quite remarkable uh, atmospheric uh, score, which sounds like it could be taken from another film, but it's actually all original compositions. What was your uh, working relationship there, and did you point him in the direction of some classic film scores that he might want to echo? Uh, yeah, I, uh, the, the idea I had was that I'm interested in truth, but I'm not interested in reality. So I like to cut the documentary film like a fiction film, and I would like to score it like a fiction film. This is what we did. So for the style of the film, in terms of the pace and cutting, F for fake. That's always my, my, my editor's reference for cutting a film. We do F for fake. And which is a film by Orson Welles, coincidentally, an Iranian co-production. For the music, so we needed to do something with I mean, jazz is the music I like, and we wanted to do something with a jazz group, but not necessarily jazzy. So we had all the temp music there, and what Eckhart did actually was to compose based on their original compositions, but in terms of the pace, tempo, uh, the dynamics and everything, staying close to what we had used as temp music. And in one case, that was for the finale, there was a piece by Duke Ellington, and I said, I love it so much, and the producers agreed to pay for it, to clear the rights for it. But Eckhart said, let me try something. If you didn't like it, do your Ellington. He did the last piece, which uh, is, I think is absolutely brilliant. I said, no, no, we're going to keep this. But the reference for him was, uh, there was a, a Polish surgeon and jazz pianist, Christoph Komeda. He did one film in Denmark called Sult. That's, I knew I wanted something like Sult because it's hunger in English. Knut Hamsun. Yes. There is sounds like uh, it, electronic music, but it's, everything is actually acoustic and very hypnotic music. So that was one of the references. And then Thelonious Monk, because I wanted the feeling that you don't know what the next note is going to be. It is happy. Is it sad? Is it going up? Is it going down? You don't know. And I wanted to create that kind of sense of suspense throughout including uh, in, the, in the final music, musical piece heard in the film. And back to Hitchcock. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. We have microphone, which will come to you if you put your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Hassan. I'm really glad I got to see this film. Uh, one question I have is when you were filming during kind of the, you know, going through the reels at the time, what were the intentions of documenting it at the time? Like, I'm curious to know what seed... How long did you know you were going to make a film about this? Or what was the reason, you know, you were recording as you were kind of sorting and finding and having conversations? I was recording everything. Okay. Thank you. I was just documenting everything. And uh, 
it was there was no plan for a documentary. I had absolutely no idea that I was going to make a film about it someday. There was no plan for Ahmad dying. There was no plan for me not being in that country. It was that was the moment, and it was just being documented. However, when I returned to the footage for editing the film, I realized actually there is a pattern or some patterns, the visual patterns, that I had created in order to um, to connect all these different fragments. One of the things that I mentioned to Neil yesterday was that using my finger to touch the lips of the actresses in the movie posters, I don't do that on a daily basis. It was done, like I thought of Jean-Paul Bemondo in reverse, like doing this. And the also other thing was the zoom in into the faces of some of the actors in the film that I have used a couple of times in the film. So trying to create visual motives as I was shooting this randomly day in, day out with him. I was there all the time. And there was no plan, absolutely no plan. And even when I started making the film, I was totally unsure about wanting to make this film. And this is a film that I tried to watch once in London, the second screen, and I couldn't just, I was staring at the carpet. Right? It's just for me impossible to watch it. Uh, and we were, it was so hard to edit it, especially when it involved my physical presence in the farm. So the, we then came up with the idea of calling a person in third person uh, and calling him names. That was very, very liberating. Like, you know, the son of a bitch, he goes for, it was easier to, to uh, treat him without any respect to, for, in order to become a character, in order for me to, to be able to look at the images that we were cutting. And the, the, uh, the idea that he would then be a film star in his own film, a documentary about him, would Ahmad see this as the kind of, would he see it as a film, or a film is only MGM, Sid Charisse, you know, his, his, uh, he, for him, would this be like still a film, or would it be like something it else? It would have been, yes, because there are people here sitting looking at him, yeah. <laughs> the, the new Fardin has been found. If anybody does, yes, on the right side, microphone will come. What are your favorite films um, done in Iran the last 30 years? After 30 the years. revolution, yes, after the revolution. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm sure there are some films I like. I can't remember any. Many films I like, I'm sure. Kira, uh, Kira Oh, You know, to name one, of course. But uh, I can, you know, let me be a bit unorthodox about it. The, the lady who has edited my film, Nia Sagari, she's also a filmmaker, experimental filmmaker. And she's a, she uh, shoots her own films, she processes it, she cuts the films in analog. And I absolutely admire the small pieces she does, three, four minute long films in black and white, super eight. And they are very poetic, very haunting, very personal. Nia Sagari, like, you know, Kiarostami, everybody knows him. There are many other great names, but, you know, the editor of this film is, is one of my favorite experimental filmmakers. Next question, maybe at the back, if anybody can make themselves visible, we can see there. No, perhaps not. No, they're still, still absorbing the film. Um, what is next for you? Do you plan to make more films? Because I would imagine making films and being co-director of a, of a major film festival God is forbid. tricky. I mean, I, I had enough of making these things now. I have to go and find a decent job. Architect, architect. <laughs> who knows? I'd, whatever that pays the bills. We, we are running out of time, so if anybody does have a very last question, this is yes. It always gets one when I say that. <laughs> uh, thank you for the film. Uh, I wanted to ask: Have you been back to Iran and tried to um, find the treasures of Ahmed? Uh, no. The answer is no. No. Uh, do you want to, I mean, the second no, I can explain why, because this film is about that, not wanting to get back, not wanting to look back, wanting to look forward, to trying to overcome the obsession, trying to avoid doing, making the same mistakes that Ahmad made. Uh, so in a way, you know, I care a lot, a great deal, but at the same time, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life thinking about it, searching for it. Uh, you know, I have moved on. 